Managers. Um, so, did we come to a consensus? What do we think? Password managers, good, bad? Good. Good. Anyone want to counter argument? Bad. Bad. You can't <laughs> say that. You're an underage kid. Yeah. I, I mentioned this last time, but if you don't trust any of those options, then the formulaic approach of having a base password and editing that based on the URL is a fairly good one. Yeah, so we kind of actually even talked about, we laughed a little bit at people who maybe write down their username and password on a post-it note and then post it on their computer, right? But here you're writing down your username and password and giving it to another company who's not you, another entity, so who knows what they can do with it, right? So that's, uh, a lot of it does boil down to trust and who you trust. Mind, not, not all of these are online though. That key pass you can have is a local database. And How do you know it's local? Well, it's open source. You could compile it yourself. That way you would know exactly what's running and you could be sure that it's trustworthy. How many people compile it themselves? Not many, but some people <laughs> can. And how do you know there's no vulnerability in key pass that somebody could use to get access to your key pass database? The same way that you're sure for most things that are open source that have been reliably tested by other companies and his source code has been thoroughly looked at. Are there reports of vulnerability analysis of key pass and source code? Um, I think some of the previous versions, but I know some of the forks have fixed some of those. Yeah, what about every single every single update too, right? So yeah, you have to keep up with the updates. It's not easy, yeah. but like you know, there are options which prevent you from having to rely on some foreign, or some other company keeping it on their servers and stuff like that. Sure, yeah. Um, uh, and you can, I guess, by extension, write something yourself, right? But then you could easily mess you up the crypto that. and you, know, you would not, not do that. So, anyways, it's a, a complex trade off decision. I think there's a lot of kind of factors that come into here that we've talked about. Um, and then we talked about this a little bit of. Well, the key, one of the key downsides of passwords is that users forget their password, right? And if we think about this as an authentication mechanism, if I'm supposed to authenticate you, only you knowing that password. So what are the different ways that users can get access to their account even when they've forgotten their password? Yeah. Email. Email. So what happens in an email? In an email scenario? Uh, they send you a link to email. Yeah, maybe. It depends on how they do it, right? Maybe like we said, if they're storing passwords Actually, just send you your password, and now your password for that site is in your email forever. Security questions. Security questions. So, what are security questions? What, is, what was your first pet's name? What's your first pet's name? What are some other security questions you've seen? Your mother's maiden name. What else? What's the name of the street you grew up on? The street you grew up on. <coughs> first school. Uh, element name your elementary school. Uh, favorite sports team. First car. Child. What was it? First car. First car. Yeah, that's pretty good. First significant other. Yeah, maybe names of significant others. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so all of these are types of, they call them security questions, right? And so what's the goal there? So when did you supply that information? Registration. So when you registered for the account on the site, similar to when you gave them the username password, you also created a number of these other questions. Yeah, okay, so we have email, we have security, Questions, what else? Text. What was it? I can get like a confirmation code sent to your phone. A text? Yeah, so maybe they check that you have a phone number associated. 
associated with that account, and then you still control that phone number. So they'll send you a text and maybe put in the code, and then that gives you now access to the account or unlock the account. What else? Magic links. Magic links, what's that? Uh, where they'll send you a link to your email, you just click it and then it auto logs you in. Okay, so it goes back to the email but with auto login rather than, so you don't actually even need to know your password. You just link in your email, click it, and you're logged in. Anything else? What about a phone call? You ever have to call, especially for high value things like a bank? Like if you get locked out of your bank account, it's a big pain. You have to call and talk to a person and convince them you are who you say they are. Um, probably supplying a lot of information, like security questions, other types of ways. Um, so, yeah, so. And let's think about the security of those things. So what about an email, sending an email to you? Is that secure or what are the possible threats against that? Yeah. It definitely depends like how secure the person then treats their email. Okay, so it depends on the security of the person receiving their email? Yeah. Yeah, what else? Um, <laughs> given that most, most emails are not sent in any sort of secure format, you know, if you were just like, Looking at all of the emails that were sent on the internet, I'm sure you could pick up some that are like, oh, look at this password reset. Let me take this and yeah. set it to whatever I want. Click the link, get access to an account, right? So password, uh, most email is sent in plain text over the internet. We're going to go over how the internet and networks work, so we'll actually understand what that means. Um, but there definitely are places where people can see that those messages. Yeah, what else? What's the good thing about it? Similar to that, we have the 
the risk of somebody stealing that and then probably leveraging similar questions on different sites, right? Now they're able to gain more information about you. Um, yeah, and furthermore, they're probably likely stored in plain text, so if they're stolen, because usually those security questions also will authenticate you when you call in to be, uh, to somebody. Yeah, any other? Kind of related to the humans in the loop open you up to new attacks thing. If you have someone who used to be a close friend but now is uh, now is your adversary, then they might know yeah, some of the answers to your questions. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. crazy. And so this also goes back to something we talked about earlier of the security of your inbox, right? Your email is super important because mainly because all of the password reset emails go to your email. Somebody has access to your email account, they have access to everything. Okay. So we've been talking a lot about different types of authentication factors, right? We've been talking about uh, what you know, what you have, what you are, right? Uh, general cases, passwords, um, uh, a secure device, or a, like a UBP and a fingerprint. And so we talked about actually pros and cons of each of those. But then the question becomes, well, why not combine them into, into uh, combine them so that rather than only needing one type of factor to authenticate, now we can think of a two-factor or multi-factor authentication. Uh, so does anybody have any experience with this? Yeah, someone want to give an example of what it is? Yeah. I mean, like, on almost all of my accounts, I have, like, an app on my phone that has, like, Google Authenticator, I think it's called. Yeah, so you have a Google Authenticator app with a constantly changing uh, key or password or uh, sorry, <laughs> code, let's say, a uh, series of digits. And the idea is rather than, it's got to be an and, it can't be an or. We'll talk about that in a second, right? But rather than saying, okay, uh, you either tell me, tell me the password, you actually have to give a password and have access to a device. Um, and this is based on our authentication categories. Uh, anybody use Duo Security for ASU? A lot of you. Does everyone have to do it? Not yet. Not yet. ETO's right. still working it out. Yeah, yeah it's just like some staff. staff, student workers, yeah. TAs, those kinds of things. Eventually, every student's supposed to, but that was also set two years ago. So. Uh, yeah. So implementing these kinds of things can be tricky. Uh, so somebody want to talk about what the, what it's like using Duo Security for ASU plugin? So what is it, how it, I mean, mechanically how it's like, how you talk about how it's like.
So let's analyze it from a security perspective. What is this trying to do? Send me a push, call me, or enter a passcode. Okay. But cool. if you opt not to use the app, mm -hmm. it'll just send you like six different text messages. Oh, it'll, interesting. And then it'll tell you like, enter the one that ends in zero nine, and then you have to like look through. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay. Uh, cool. So there are non-app options. Okay. So basically, all those three options: so a push to an app that's running on my phone, a text message to my phone, or a passcode that's generated by the app on my phone. All of those options require that you have the phone, right? So this means now, if you wanted to log into my account, what do you actually have to do? Yeah, you have to not only steal my phone, but you have to actually break into my phone, right? So I have a password on my phone. And then you have to break into my phone and be able to uh, authenticate to the app. So it's raising the bar significantly for an attacker, right? Rather than just stealing my username and password, which we just talked about all the ways that that's easy to do. To now, or I guess the other way to do it, you could steal my phone if there's a way you could get uh, malware onto my phone, right? So download a malicious app that compromises the operating system of the iPhone. Um, I'll tell you like a remote iPhone compromise. It's probably a, worth at least one to two million dollars. Selling or buying that exploit from somebody, so I'm not. I don't know. I don't think your grade in that class is worth that much. <laughs> um, so I would not recommend that route. Um, okay, cool. So everyone understands how it works mechanically. Duo. So then, what do you think about it? People who've actually used it. It sucks. Device that 
Right, so yeah, that does open some kind of attack window where it is remembering you. It's a little bit, there's a bunch of other features that they probably use, like if you log in from a brand new uh, laptop or even browser, it would try to authenticate you again. So it only remembers you for seven days on that browser. So it is theoretically possible for an attacker to, if they have your password and were inside your machine, to use your, your actual browser itself to log in. So it's possible, but it does raise the bar. Um, if you lose your phone, then you can't get into your accounts. Yeah, so then we still have the same problem of how do you then recover your account? Has anyone done that before? Yeah? Do you want to explain what happens with
We could try to do kind of IP address based authentication, so where you only allow people access to your service from either a, a VPN or based on a certain IP address. Ah, so this is an interesting thing. Anybody have a car that will unlock when you get close? Yeah? So, yeah, so it's kind of interesting, right? Because what does it mean by close? You have to like, touch the you have to yeah, but how does, so how do you know there's not a bad guy there, like waiting for you to get close and then push, touching the handle? The, well, if you do the driver's side, it only opens the driver's side. Or only unlock the driver's side. How far away will it do that from? And can the attacker boost the signal so you could be three blocks away and they unlock your car and get into your car? <laughs> yeah. Mine is like two car lengths away, <coughs> and it the entire car. Because people will be in the passenger. <laughs> yeah, so it depends on the implementation, and, uh, and yeah, it's, it's very interesting. There actually have been attacks where they're able to kind of let you boost the signal such that you can be in your house, and they essentially trick the car to make the key, make them think that the key is closer, or trick the key to think the car is closer, and so they can just unlock the car in your driveway, and sometimes even start it because it thinks that the car is start the car and start driving away. Um, but these are all kind of trying to authenticate based on proximity, which is a very different kind of concept than we looked at. Yeah. I guess the only redeeming thing of that is like when the car starts to drive away, it realizes the key is not in the car and it stops the car. I think it depends on the car. I don't know that they all I, I know mine will, it'll stop. Yeah. Oh man. That's not all do that. <laughs> mine will let you like drive if the car, like it'll let you continue driving if the key's not in it. Uh -huh. But then if you stop the car, you can't restart it without the key. Yeah, so maybe the interesting thing is there to just drive out the back of the truck. Uh, uh, go away and strip the parts or whatever they do. Yeah, some cars are like so old that you could leave the key and drive off of it and then you'll lose the key forever. Because it actually happened where like one of our friends left the key on the hood of the car, drove off, oh. and then, yeah, basically <laughs> he, he never got the key back. So he had to like shut down the car and just wait until a new key arrived for his SUV. Wow. So yeah, these are all like a very different type, and then there's other ways they've shown, um, researchers have looked at the way that this works, and they've actually in some cases broken the cryptography used there to talk to the cars, and maybe uncovered the keys that are used so they could make a universal key that opens any car of that maker. Um, yeah, all kind of, actually, there's a super interesting story where I believe they did this with don't remember the manufacturer. I want to say Volkswagen, and then Volkswagen like sued the researchers, and it was a big deal. And like even the um, also sued the conference where they were speaking at. So they didn't speak that year, but they did the next year. So, anyways, it's all kinds of crazy stuff. But um, yeah, we talked about like biometrics, right? So we have fingerprint readers, voice recognition, face recognition. Um, kind of the scary thing is uh, we talked about breaking fingerprints, right? We can three D print some of these fingerprints. How would you break voice recognition? Recordings? Yeah, or like what? What's that? Deep learning. Deep learning? Yeah, you can use machine learning uh, models so you can train it based on snippets of somebody's voice and you can synthesize a uh, voice speech that's exactly like theirs. Um, actually, I think it was two years ago, 2018 DEF CON Falls. Um, one of the uh, of my fellow organizers, if you know Jan, I think he just for 66, he created a challenge called Adam Tune, which basically <laughs> they would go to, he'd train a machine learning model on my voice, and then he would ask them for a phrase, and then they would have to send an audio file that passed and matched as my voice in that phrase. So teams used all these YouTube videos that I have of class and whatever, and downloaded them and chopped it up into snippets and were able to make, like, bypass this authentic voice authentication mechanism by stealing my voice, basically. It was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> for the teams and for me. We pulled it off. Uh, I didn't see a flag. <laughs> yeah. uh, face recognition, right? So other things, we talked about some of the difficulties there. How do you detect if that face is live? Because it could be a picture, right? Or it could be a mask. Um, so how do you detect that? Yeah. Um. I don't think this was mentioned before, but I remember reading something about the algorithm that was used in most fingerprint readers. Mm -hmm. It was that eventually researchers managed to create a 
universal fingerprint mm -hmm. that matched like 70% of fingerprints? Yeah, that was, uh, I can't remember exactly where that research was from, but basically it wasn't that 70% of us have fingerprints that are the same. That would be kind of crazy. Um, or I guess against what we think of for fingerprints. What they found was that, so we talked about when you store fingerprints, right? You have to store features from that fingerprint. You have to use an algorithm to compare similarities. And they were able to basically exploit how these machine learning algorithms work to create fake fingerprints that would work and unlock 75% of people's phones. Just because it happened to have the right features where the machine learning model would say, yes, this is the same person. Um, yeah, that was a super interesting one. That's like a skeleton fingerprint. Kind of. Cool. And yeah, some other types of authentication research. Uh, super interesting topic is this notion of continuous authentication, right? So most systems that we use authenticate us right when we're using the system and then just let us have free access to the system, right? But how do you know that a user is actually still the same user, right? So you can think of, um, so they've done all kinds of stuff looking at, uh, you could look at typing because people have kind of a similar pattern when they type. So as they're using a system, you could lock them out because you detect that it's somebody different typing because somebody else locked up the machine and started typing. You could have, for mobile devices, they do gait uh, detection. So apparently, you know, how people walk is roughly the same and dip, like, same for one person, different for others. You could use that as an authentication mechanism. Um, and kind of, I think we're pretty used to this when using certain web applications. I wouldn't say it's necessarily continuous, but there is. So if you, for instance, were to go, I don't know, uh, let's say for Amazon's a good example. So when you go purchase an item, it, you're purchasing it to an address that's already been used with a credit card that's already been used. It just happens automatically, you don't have to do anything. But if you change the, the address to a new address, what do you have to do? Put in the card again, the credit card again, right? Because uh, they don't want you to, somebody got hacked into your account and then shipping items to a new address of the hackers choosing, using a previously used credit card. So at least they make you type in either that same credit card again or a different credit card. Um, okay, and there's a lot of uh, research into replacing passwords, uh, kind of going back to the notion that we agree that passwords are not the best form of authentication, but they're the most widely used. And so there's types of basically trying to do, and we talked about this, I think, with the UE keys, of essentially having some device or some key that you can maybe store not exactly a password, but cryptographic based authentication so that uh, based on like the private key stored in your um, either FIDO chip or whatever, or YubiKey, you could authenticate to a system. Uh, something we didn't talk about is uh, access or authentication delegation. So that this idea that, um, for instance, um, you go to some random website, rather than creating an account with that website, you log in with Facebook, and so you log in with Facebook and you tell Facebook, hey, tell this website who I am. And so in this way, um, so there's actually a lot of examples of these. One is uh, the main example of how all these work is OAuth uh, 2.0. This is the latest version here. If you're interested in that, you just look that up, let you. Um, and also, if you use many ASU online services, you'll actually notice they will be able to log you in with ASU. There's also, if you use with ASU, that actually logs you in with ASU, same, similar thing, uh, and they use the, like, micro, uh, it, the Microsoft 365 version of email for ASU, or even the Google one, right? You go to google.com, you log in with your ASU email, and it redirects you to ASU's login, that you log in, and then they log you into Gmail, so all this has to do with, well, how do you authenticate, and how does <coughs> Google know and trust that ASU actually verified your, your identity. Um, so there's interesting kind of questions there. Any questions, thoughts on authentication? Cool. All right, and now we get to go into networks.
understand how networks work. Networks work. Um, and it all starts with kind of a suite of protocols that are used to transmit data. And it's actually kind of a fascinating problem when you really start thinking about it. The question, and this is something that we're used so much either with our cell phones or laptops or whatever. How does data or information get from your laptop to Google and back? Right? There's actually several entities along the way. It has to traverse ASU's network, and then it has to go to ASU's uh, CenturyLink internet service provider. That, that packet then has to go from there to uh, Google's service provider, and then into Google's network, and then finally to Google, and that packet has to make it all the way back to you. Um, potentially stopping at 15, 20, 30 different servers or switches or whatever that are routing and changing traffic. So uh, it's kind of crazy that all this stuff actually works. Um, and it's really based on this idea of the TCP IP protocol suite. Um, and the other really cool thing is it's based on this notion of um, abstraction and encapsulation. So we're going to study kind of this at the layers that we need to. Each layer handles a very specific networking thing. So um, we'll look at it. It's better as an example. So at the lowest layer, we have the physical layer, which is how actually these bits, these ones and zeros, get translated physically. So if you think about uh, right now, most of you are on Wi-Fi, right? So how does your ones and zeros get from your machine to your Wi-Fi access point? When, and this is, I actually know very little about wireless networking. I don't know how that works. Uh, some physics magic. <laughs> um, other types of physical layers would be an Ethernet cable, probably familiar with that, or maybe a coaxial cable, which is what your cable modem needs to use to get data physically from your user ISP, or even um, between countries, we have uh, fiber optic cables that are run in the um, ocean that carry, use light to send your bits and your data from one place to another. It's kind of crazy. So on top of that, we have the link layer. So this is the layer that um, basically handles the question of how do two links physically send uh, information and how do they communicate with each other? So this would answer the question of how does data get from your, your laptop to the access point? Um, above that, then we have the internet layer. So this deals with how does data get from your laptop to Google? Above that, we'll talk about two different uh, TCP and UDP. How does how do we send data so that we know the other side can read it? This is actually a super interesting, complex problem that you should be thinking about. Of how would I design a protocol such that I can talk to a remote machine? Any of us can go away at any time, and um, but how do I know that the other side received my information that I sent? Um, super interesting, super cool. And then on top of that, we have all these different applications that have been built using these, this whole stack. So things like uh, HTTP, so the web that we think about, HTTP, HTTPS is just an application that runs on top of the internet. Um, SMTP is the mail transport protocol, is how emails get sent out. Uh, DNS, how we look up and translate domain names to IP addresses. Uh, NFS, the network file system, how you can access files over the network. Um, so this is an important point I'll probably reiterate multiple times. Um, as you can see, this entire thing you can think of as like TCP IP stack or the network stack, or you can think of it as like the internet stack. Um, so this is one of the key things, is the web is just one application that's running on this whole thing, right? So the web and the internet are two very distinct different things. Uh, so it's important to kind of remember that. Uh, we're going to start with. I don't want to do that. Okay, yes. Okay, we're going to start at how do you <coughs> name things? So think about uh, physical mail. How does your, you write, think about it, it's kind of crazy. We have a system where you can sit down, write some message out, put it into an envelope, put 40 cents on it, and it can get sent to anywhere in the United States. How does the person who gets that message know where to get it, where to send it? Yeah, the, ad okay, the address, so the address that you write on there, 
So what we've done, this is exactly the same as 32 bits. What we've done, is we've taken each byte, so 32 bits, uh, 8 bits to a byte, so 32 bits is 4 bytes. So on the far left is the topmost byte, so the most significant byte uh, expressed in decimal. So it's 0 to 255, and then a dot, and then the next byte, 0 to 255, and then a dot, and the next byte, 0 to 255. And finally, 0 to 55. Make sense? Yeah. So. Questions? Okay. So we got an address. a movie or something, you can easily tell when they have no idea what they're doing. If you see something like this, uh, I don't know, 10 dot 300 dot 20 dot 1. Uh, why is this an invalid IP address? Yeah, the 300, right? It's above, these are all bytes, so they are 0 to 255, can't be larger than that, can't have 256, um, or anything higher. So it's a clear, easy way to say this is a movie and nobody knows what they're doing. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, something I noticed that like IP addresses, like they can be manual too. Like you can actually manually decide them. I guess that always confuses me. Like how mm -hmm. that works. Uh, we will probably not get in super in depth in that, but yes, you're. Uh, you can have your own, create your own address. Basically, the question is, will anybody listen to you or talk to you with that address? And that's the kind of interesting part. But yeah, you can, and this is how you can try to, and why you need things like HTTPS uh, to identify people, because you can pretend to be the IP address of Google.com, and nobody necessarily will know. But also, maybe nobody sent you packets. So, anyways, okay. So now we have a concept of an address, right? So now we can have, uh, we'll call this U for us. And we have G for Google. Okay. So we'll kind of start simple and we'll get more and more complicated as we go. So we have some IP address and Google has some IP address. Right? 
So we want to send them some piece of information. So just like when you're sending um, a postcard or sending, let's say, something through the mail, right? Here I'm just going to call this data. So I have something I'm trying to send from me to Google. It doesn't really matter what it is right now. We'll ignore that. But I'm sending some bit of information to Google. That's like the letter I'm writing. What do I write on that envelope? So how do I get it from me to Google? Return address. Well, I need one thing. First is Google. It's like, where's it going, right? So I need to probably write something like the destination is IP address Google. And is that it? Yeah, so usually when you write a letter, what else do you put on the envelope? Your address. Why do you put your address? So if it gets like lost, they can come back. So if they get lost, they can come back to you. But also, if the other person responds to you, where do they write back to you? Right. So it's a way so that they can communicate back to you. So we also need the source of IP. And as we'll see, there's other stuff that is added here. But essentially, this is the idea of this encapsulation. So we take the data that we want to send, and we say, we'll add some headers to this. This, uh, this source IP and destination IP are headers of the IP address layer that says, OK, this is going to Google's IP, and it's from the user's IP. OK, cool. And then we'll see exactly how this happens. But essentially, something happens, and it gets to Google. And then Google can then maybe type up a reply that they can then put inside of an IP packet. And what would be the destination there? The IP address of us and the source. IPG, Google's IP. And they can send this, and this will go back to us. Cool. So, And this seems kind of crazy, but um, as we'll see, the IP protocol, by like understanding it at this level, is representing the basically the glue of the internet. So you have this notion of how do you send information between two IP addresses on the internet. And the crazy thing is in the things I feel like that it does not provide to you. So if you think, hey, I'm going to develop a communication mechanism, uh, what are some properties maybe that you'd want that data being sent from one person to another? Yeah. Default encryption. Maybe it's encrypted so nobody else can read it. Yeah. Yeah, and call, I want to know that the other person received my message. These are actually all, you can also think about the post office and the postal system. There's actually all things you can get through there. You get a certified delivery, so you get a legally uh, binding notice that somebody received the email, the message that he sent. Yeah. Ah, maybe verify the sender too, so that the person is who they say they are, the IP address is who they say they are. Yeah. The message wasn't changed in transit. Nobody changed the message in transit. What about um, debugging? <coughs> So we talked about the mail actually may, if something happens to your mail, they can actually uh, either send you a notice or send it back to you. What happens if that address doesn't exist? Right? Does the post office just throw your, me your message away? No, they send it back to you. They return the sender. This person doesn't even live here, right? Like the address existed, but the person you're trying to talk to doesn't exist. Right? These are all things you may want from your communication network. And surprisingly, it turns out IP provides none of these. Not a single thing that we talked about. And even worse, it even provides less guarantees. So other things, when you send a letter, you wouldn't magically think that two or three letters appear. right? But with digital data, you could easily create a copy of some message that you're trying to send, and two copies arrive. Or uh, you know, if you, send, if you think about the post office, if you sent um, Maybe a letter every day. I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six. You probably expect them to arrive roughly in that order, right? You wouldn't expect six to arrive first and then one a month later. Um, so, yeah.
basically the IP layer provides almost nothing. It is connectionless, so you don't establish a connection. It's all based on what we think of as, uh, we call many different things. You call it like a datagram, uh, or you just think of it as a chunk of data, so just like send some data to somebody. It is unreliable, or maybe another way to think of this is it doesn't provide any reliability guarantees. There's no guarantee that your message will get to the person, even if it's possible and they're up. Uh, best effort, so best effort meaning they'll try to do it, but hey, if it fails, eh, tough. Like, I don't know, we tried. It was snowing, we just threw the letters away. We didn't feel like delivering mail today. Um, and this means that things that like delivery, integrity, ordering, non-duplication, and bandwidth are not guaranteed. Your message could get dropped and changed at any point along the way. And this runs all of our networks. Every single data that you're sending it uses this. So why does anything work? People build systems on either end. What is that? People build systems on either end to try and, under, to try and like fix these problems? Kind of. Uh, in some sense, yeah, you do. So you do need these, these uh, properties, right, of a networking system. The interesting thing comes into these layers that we talked about, right? So we look, internet's kind of in the middle. Does, and so if everything you build on is building on the internet layer, and does, so think about it this way, does every type of electronic communication that you want to do require uh, a guarantee that every information you send is received? What's an example? it simpler. So the other thing um, I didn't really talk about is these uh, protocols were designed in the early days of the internet. Um, and so you know, if you can make it, you're trying to build a complex system, you should try to make it as simple as possible to see if it will actually work first. Um, but the problem is if you're successful, now think about well, what if we just change one of these layers that would be insane. We'd have to all, literally, everyone would have to take their computers, up, like unplug it from the internet, upgrade, and then turn them back on all at the same time. And if this sounds insane, they actually did that for uh, the precursor to TCP was uh, NCP, the Network uh, Control Protocol, I believe. And it had massive, it had some significant flaws that they had a flag day, where literally at the time the internet was so small they just shut everything down, upgraded, and turned it back on. Now think about trying to do that with billions, literally billions, there's a billion people on Facebook. Like, think about how many devices are out there that would just be impossible. All right, cool. 
And the high, the high level idea is basically that these IP datagrams, and this is the whole notion of an address. If you have an IP address of someone, you can send them packets uh, or datagrams. And, and then, as we saw, so IP is kind of in this middle layer, and then it depends on a lower link level protocol for things to actually move from one machine to the other. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, specifically, we'll focus on Ethernet. And so, super interesting, very cool if you're interested in this stuff. Everything that we're going to talk about, all these protocols and everything, is all open. So you can just Google for RFC. RFC stands for Request for Comments. This is a standard, I believe it's the Internet Engineering Task Force manages the RFC thing. So if you think you actually have a better standard for whatever system, you write an RFC, you send it out, people get comments on it, and then eventually it's adopted. So everything about IP is, is defined in this um, RFC. So we'll think of IP datagram 32, uh, it's just a string of ones and zeros, right? So it's just uh, data that's added in the header just like we had in that picture on top of the actual uh, data itself. So very first thing in the first four bits is the version number. Why is that important? So think about this from a protocol design. So the very first four bits that you read from this header is the version number. If you don't know the version before you have the data, then you don't know how to interpret the data. Right, each version may change the format of the rest of this packet, right? Mm -hmm. So we're at, well, most IP is on IPv4 still now, so the version number would say four, and then that determines how you parse and understand the rest of this packet header. Um, IP, if it's IPv6, if the integer here is six, then you realize and know that to how to parse it differently. So it's a super interesting design decision when you're designing something to A, have a version number inside a protocol, and B, have it be basically the first thing that you read. And then that controls how you read everything else. Uh, then we have a bunch of stuff. Uh, so important thing here would be total length. So the length of, I believe, the header, maybe the message itself. Um, an identifier, which we'll probably not get into. Um, a couple important things. <coughs> uh, a time to live field. So this is something that um, is basically used to prevent, uh, let's say, I don't know, maybe zombie packets or undead packets. I don't know the right term. Um, so if we think of our network here, and so we send a packet to Google, do we know anything about the networks that are in between us and Google? No, we don't know how they're configured, we don't know who runs them, and we don't care, and that's the beautiful thing. But because we don't know who's running them, how do we know that uh, we send a packet into the network and somebody has messed up, and even just two machines, so the packet goes in here, and this person says, okay, where does this packet go for IP Google? Here. And this switch says, uh, where does the packet go for IP Google? Here. And this says, where does the packet go for IP Google? Here. And they're just constantly passing this data back and forth. So you can easily get this due to misconfigurations. And if you have nothing in place to prevent this, literally your messages will just go forever and be stuck in the network forever. So to prevent this, they have this feature, this notion that they call time to live. So every hop along the way, this time to live number is uh, decremented by one. So it starts at some value, it uh, doesn't really matter, 60, 80, whatever. And then every hop is decremented. And then when it reaches zero, uh, it's thrown away. Yeah. It's like a maximum number of hops you could make, or could you have a packet and just die before it reaches its. It is uh, eight bits, so the most is 255. Yeah. So, yeah, it also then restricts the size of uh, things, which is interesting. I don't think it ever gets reset. I think that would mess things up. It just the nice thing is you would you may get a reply back like we talked about the mail saying hey your packet was lost because of um, because of the time to live fail 
And here's, and this identifier actually uniquely identifies that packet, so you would know what, what packet it was. Um, okay, so yeah, interesting thing there. Uh, protocol is also kind of interesting. Um, it, yeah, we'll kind of go that for now. <coughs> Some important things, so we have source IP and destination IP. So this is super, this is interesting, right? This is useful. This is what we need in this packet. This is kind of the main thing that we drew on that uh, packet, and it's 32 bits. So it's exactly 32 bits. Uh, we have some options, and then some padding, and then finally the data of the packet that we're sending. So this is kind of a nice way to think about um, data that's being sent. What is the HL? I don't remember off the top of my head. Fair enough. Somebody can look that up. I can make something up, but nothing makes sense right now. So I, um, the cert, yeah, the cert, oh. I know the service type um, was used because they thought like, want quality of service features to say like, oh, this is high priority traffic or low priority traffic or whatever, so you could route it properly. But of course, then they realize, well, everyone always says their traffic is high priority. So mm -hmm. it's a silly feature, yeah. I'm going to get header then. Ah. Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. It is. Ah, it is. OK, cool. Yeah, that makes sense. So header length and then the total length. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. And then other interesting thing, we have a header checksum. So what's a checksum? verify that previous information was correct? Yeah, so it kind of depends, but the checksum helps you verify that, kind of verify that nothing was changed. So for <coughs> instance, actually, there's actually a checksum on your credit card number. I don't know if you know this or not, but it's a, I think it's called a LUN, L-U-H-N check, where uh, you run this check on a credit card number, and if the end value is not Correct, it means that it's an invalid credit card number. So this is how sometimes they can tell you it's an in, and the idea is they can tell you you mistyped your credit card number before talking to your bank. So they can know just right then. Um, similar, kind of similar idea here, except the important thing for us is that this is not a cryptographically secure hash function. So it is, um, it can easily detect if a bit is accidentally flipped, but if an attacker, an attacker can um, actually just compute the, the checksum. So it's not anything that's actually cryptographically secure. Okay, cool. So important thing to think about, and this is going to be a theme that we're going to look at now. Let's look at this packet from a security perspective. So even just thinking about, and we'll, let's put this next to our cool diagram. Right? So now we have a little bit more details into what's, okay, cool. So now we have more details of what's in this packet, right? We just had source IP, destination IP, right? So let's think about this, and this is what I always like to do, and what's really important when thinking about and analyzing these situations in terms of security, right? So we've constructed this situation where we are IPU, we want to send a packet to IPG, but, from Google's perspective, right, so the machine there that has the IP address G, when it receives this packet, so it receives this packet, right, it receives a packet that is destination IP address D, G, source IP address U with some data. What can it, and actually, and we know that it's actually all of this header information here in this diagram, what data can it trust? And what data can't it trust? Or what does it know? Maybe another thing to think about. The destination IP address? It knows the destination IP address. Why? Yeah. Because it got there. Yeah, because it got there, right? It's, the machine is G. It knows it has the IP address G. It just got a packet. It can check, did this packet come, is it destined for IPG? 
Yes, cool. This packet is definitely for me. What else can I trust about this packet? Yeah. Uh, I guess the checksum verifies that the header is valid. Yeah, so, so I can use the checksum, verify that uh, there weren't any random bit flips along the way that uh, invalidated the, the header checksum. What about the source ID? Right, so it's got a packet. It says it's from IPU. It goes great. Let me respond to that and reply back. Yeah, so we don't know, and if we think about it, ah, I gotta zoom in a little bit. So if we think about it from Google's perspective, all it knows is it's connected to the network. All it knows is it's got a packet destined for it, and that packet has the source IP of IPU. It does not know that that machine even exists, that it's on, that it's controlled by anyone. Um, as we'll see, and it turns out that uh, we'll use We'll use Eve here. Eve can actually inject a packet and completely control the headers. <coughs> and send whatever data she wants to Google. Google gets it, sees the source and says, well, this is uh, the source of IPU, right? Google has actually no way of knowing where this packet actually came from. So this is what we're looking at. We've talked about all the things we want about authentication, all that stuff. Nothing exists like that in the IP layer at all. Anybody can spoof and pretend to be anyone at an IP layer. Now let's think though, what happens, okay, Google gets this packet from Eve, Google replies to it, what happens with that packet? Yeah, it goes back to IPU and not Eve, right? So Eve maybe doesn't see the reply, so that may influence things. But now we're trying to understand what type of things, what kind of things can the tiger control, what types of things in a packet can be trusted, not trusted. So, um, yeah, so basically all of this stuff in red, actually technically everything, um, <coughs> An attacker can control things that they'll mess with are usually the things in red. Okay. So this is how, uh, so now we've looked at the header, we've looked at IP addresses, we've looked at it in terms of addresses there. Now we need to think about, well, how does data actually move from one place to another? So. We have this kind, of, we use this kind of just like squiggles, right? Of just like, yeah, yeah, stuff happens, we send a packet out and it goes somewhere. Um, we know from, so we basically have the IP header and the IP data that we're trying to send. And that is, all of these packets and all this information is essentially encapsulated one inside the other in terms of uh, like an onion. So that is actually gonna be at the link layer and that's gonna make up the link layer data and the link layer will have some header data. So first we're going to talk, and we're going to talk about specifically how that happens. We need a slight detour to think about. Okay, so we just had IPG. We had IPU. But the question is, Where does the data go? Who's the first person that takes our data? Right, we just have IP addresses. We know, so we think, uh, again, going back to the post office analogy, we know there is a, we can take our letter, drop it off at any post office. We may have a mailbox that we can put it into that somebody continually checks to take our messages. We need actually some similar type of notion of where did this message go? And to think about that more, we need to think about, well, networks are 
actually, so rather than thinking about it just like, a, hey, I send some stuff somewhere and it goes somewhere else, we actually have different kind of notions here. So we have, uh, we're here, maybe we're connected to, uh, I don't want to call it G, uh, I'll call it GW. Right? There actually may be several of us, uh, Alice and Bob. So a way to think about this is maybe physically, right? So right now, if we're all connected to the same access point, we're all, so this would be our link. So it's us, it's Alice, it's Bob, we're all connected to the same access point. Another way to think about this is cables. So you can think about ethernet cables. We're all connected um, to the same, I'm calling it a gateway now, but we're all on the same uh, local network. And actually I'm gonna start uh, changing my terminology. Uh, what does the term internet mean? Connected networks. Yeah, internet is interconnected networks, right? Intranet means inside, inter, I guess outside? Between. Between? There we go, that makes much more sense. Um, right, so internet is a connection of different networks. So actually what we have here, and the way this ends up working, is we have our local network, we're all connected on some switch or access point, whatever. And we need to know, we'll call it our gateway right now. So who's the person that can get data out of our local network? Because we know, and we'll talk about how, uh, we need a way to say, is Google's IP address on our local network? If not, uh, we need to give it to our gateway. So we think our gateway is connected to another switch. And now I'm going to draw a little diagram. Switches will be like this. So the gateway is connected there. And then it has another uh, gateway that's connected to our ISP. And anyways, all so-and-so until we get to Google. So we need to expand our notion. We don't just have ideas <coughs> of IP addresses. We actually need to know who's on our local network based on their IP address and who's <coughs> not on our local network so we know where to send the data. Because if they're on our local network, we'll see we can use the link layer to talk to uh, Alice and Bob can all talk to each other through the link layer. Um, and we'll talk about that uh, in, wow, two weeks. <laughs> a long time. Uh, cool. All right, we see you on Thursday. Good luck. <laughs>